بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمد الله وصلي على رسوله الكريم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن شاء الله we will now make a start on the final session of the course regarding Umar bin Khattab رضي الله تعالى عنه Alhamdulillah, we've got one and a half hours or so before seven when the course will come to an end. Alhamdulillah, the first four sessions, you could say, of the course was more with regards to Umar ibn Anhu's upbringing, his conversion to Islam, the life he had in Mecca, then to Medina, and we talked about Umar al Anhu's salient qualities, his virtues, and his akhlaq and his manners. And the reason why I touched on more of Umar al Anhu's qualities, his manners, and his characteristics. It is because some of these qualities of Umar ibn Anhu can be implemented by us in this day and age. Some of these other things like his and his administrating skills regarding his battlefield techniques. It's not that possible, but his characteristics, his manners, his akhlaq, these kind of things can be implemented by us and we can use Sayyidina Umar bin Khattab ibn Anhu as a role model. Now what we're going to do now for the remaining part of the course is talk about the administration side of Umar bin Khattab ibn Anhu's government, the skills, the reforms which he introduced and the way he would distribute the income which would come to him, the formation of the Beitul Mal, the public treasury, the way he started giving out salaries to government officials, to teachers, to ustads, to muallims, to imams, and later on we will then move on to the last part of Umar al Anhu's life regarding his assassination, what led to his assassination and his killing, and then afterwards, one or two things about his wives and about his children, and inshallah that will conclude the course. Now let's have a look at the first slide which is in front of you brothers, and that is regarding the government of Umar al Anhu. So Umar al Anhu's government is known as a unitary government where the political authority is with the Khalif. So in other words, the final decision was made by Umar al -Lani. So I mentioned in our last dars, in our last uh, course regarding Abu Bakr al -Lani, that there was a selective mashwara shura council who Umar al Anhu would take advice from, but ultimately the final decision was with Sayyidina Umar bin Khattab al Anhu. And then he goes on to explain that the Islamic State was split up into what we call many, many provinces or many, many kind of areas or sections and each province had a governor, had an emir and had a leader and they all had to, to report back to Umar al -Lani. So if you want to use an example of a company, so you've got the main person, the chairman at the top, the owner at the top and then he has various departments of the organization or company and each department is headed by so-and-so, by this person and that person. 
So similarly, the Islamic State, the capital city was in Medina Munawwara. So that's where Umar ibn Anhu was based. But then he had other provinces, other sections, and under each section, brothers and sisters, there were various governments, or governors who were in charge. So like we read before, take an example of Egypt. So that was under the rulership of As, to uh, Amr bin As ibn Anhu. So examples like that, like in Yemen, there were different rulers there, there were different governors there. So the exact same, in this particular way, Umar ibn Anhu's, the Islamic State was split up in the various ways. So he could have explained that provinces were further divided into districts. There were 100 districts in the movement, <coughs> in the empire. And he goes on to explain that each district, again, was under the charge of a junior governor, or we call these people Amir, usually appointed by Umar al Anhu himself. So each province was then split up into other sections. And each section or each district also had a leader and an Amir as well. So think of it to be, for this one day, example of you've got the king or the queen, and then you have prime ministers, and then in each city you have a councillor, or in each borough you have a councillor, and then within each area you then have a labour councillor for, say, Spark Hill or Small Heath or Yardley and so on. In this particular way, the Islamic government was kind of split or was distributed. You had the main head of state, Ayy Umar al Anhu. Then you had provinces, there was a leader and an amid there. And each province had districts and you also had a leader or someone in charge. Now, again, what's the wisdom of having so many, uh, so many governors or so many armies? So, subhanAllah, the wisdom or the hikmah behind that is just imagine a province which is so big, say, the size of England. Now, if somebody had a complaint <coughs> or somebody had an issue, if there was just one governor of, say, an area the size of England, then you can imagine that how many hurdles he or she will need to go through in getting contact with this particular Amir or this particular governor of that province. Because that governor will be so busy, he probably have so many calls, so many issues to deal with. He probably may not have the time to deal with a, a young woman or a woman's issue or a complaint. So that's why the hikmah behind having so many districts is so that if there are any issues, if there are any problems, then it can be raised uh, to the local governor who in turn will then forward the complaint or the issue to the main governor who in turn will then raise it to Sayyidina Umar bin Khattab The next paragraph goes on to explain the instructions Sayyidina Umar al Anhu would give to his officers and to his governors. And this is something which is very important. And again, we have obviously the main brothers, sisters that one day you may be, say, for example, running a government, maybe running an organization maybe running a madrasa, maybe running a masajid. So it's very important that whosoever you want to employ, whosoever you want that person to work for you, that you give that person some instructions. You tell them of the vision. You tell them that this is what we want to implement in this madrasa or in this school or in this organization. So similarly, Umar ibn Anhu, whenever he would choose a governor, he would always remind them, uh, always give them some general instructions. And we'll just go over some of the instructions he would tell his governors or his officers that I 
have not appointed you as commanders and tyrants over people. In other words, you becoming a governor of that province or army of that district, it doesn't mean that you now become a zalim or a tyrant over these people. It doesn't mean that you now start oppressing them. You start now doing zulm against them. But rather, you are their leaders so that the people may follow your examples. In other words, you be a role model. That's what a leader is. He be a role model for his people. So you be a role model. It's not like you oppress them, you take advantage of them, you manipulate them. No, the idea is that you yourself behave in such a way that people look up to you. And if you refer, remember the first hadith I mentioned, of course, that if you are going to follow role models, you know, follow people who are passed away, not people who are alive, because sometimes they may make mistakes. So try to behave in such a way that people are able to follow your exam examples. He then goes on to explain that give the Muslims their rights and do not beat them so that they may, lest they may become abusive. In other words, any rights the Muslims are asking for, so whatever right they have, always try to fulfill them and don't hit them, don't abuse them. Also, it goes on to explain that do not praise them unduly. Again, do not praise them unduly, lest they fall into error of conceit. In other words, don't praise them, don't overpraise them, don't exaggerate in praise. Because what may happen, brothers and sisters, is that by you praising them, they may become arrogant, they may then um, deviate from their aim or from what their intention was. Do not keep your doors shut in their faces. What does that mean? It means that if these weak and vulnerable people were to knock on your door and were to ask for help, were to ask you to guide them, then don't shut your doors on them. Don't say, oh, well, I can't help you. Because the whole point of you being an army, the whole point of you being the minister or the governor of that region is so that you can deal with people's needs and issues. So if they phone you, if they knock on your door, if they ask you for help and assistance, then basically uh, help them, don't ignore them, don't shut them your doors on their faces. And it goes on to explain that do not behave as if you were superior to them, for that is tyranny over them. So in other words, do not behave or act in a way that, oh, I have more power than you, I have more authority than you. Again, these points were have been repeated before that the idea of being a amir or having authority of someone is not that you manipulate the authority over these people, you start oppressing them. So similarly, if you do have authority over people, it doesn't mean that you behave in such a way that you are arrogant and you are more superior than them, but rather you behave in such a way that you are kind, you are considerate, and you try to use your powers for their good and also for your good as well. The next paragraph also explains SubhanAllah that because in those days we didn't have communication like emails or messages or these kind of things. So you can imagine that it would be very, very easy for governors or ministers to oppress someone and Umar al Anhu, who was the head of state not being made aware of it. Because there weren't calls in those days, there weren't phones in those days, or emails or text messages. So, how would Umar al Anhu make sure that the officers or the armies or the governors were not oppressing any of their people? There should be an opportunity or a platform for anyone if they do have any complaints against any of the <coughs> armies or the governors that they are they forward their complaint to Umar al-Anhu. So what would Umar al-Anhu then do? 
is that he made it necessary that all the officers, all the government officials, all the ministers of each and every single province, they had to have to go for Hajj. Why Hajj? Is because Hajj is that once in a year moment where everybody gets together. So every single officer had to, to go for Hajj. So in Hajj, Umar al Anhu would be there, all these officers would be there. Similarly, people will also be there as well. So if any person had a complaint against this officer, so because Umar al Anhu would be there as well, they would be able to take this officer to Umar al Anhu and say, Oh Umar, so and so did this to me. So subhanAllah, this was the, the firasat, you know, the insight I was referring to earlier on. Umar al Anhu had that. He made it a requirement. Every minister had to, to travel for Hajj. So if any of the people had any complaints, they were free to present any complaint against them. So this was Umar al Anhu's deep thinking and insight. So he made it necessary that there has to be a form, uh, a, a check on these ministers that they themselves don't become corrupt. They themselves do not become tyrants and start doing zulm upon the people and start uh, concealing the zulm and the oppression. And the way to stop that is that he made it necessary that every single officer needs to be in Hajj so that if anybody does have a complaint, then these people would be able to freely present their complaint to me regarding their ministers, regarding their armies, regarding their governors. Also, the last line of that paragraph also explains, subhanAllah again, Umar al Anhu's deep insight and thinking that in order to minimize corruption, he made it necessary that high salaries are paid to his staff. So every governor in the province, every minister was obliged or was told to receive high salaries. I'm going to explain as much as five to seven thousand dirhams annually, which is a lot of money in those days. So it was basically made necessary that governors, ministers, they take high salaries. And obviously there's no need for me to explain any further, but obviously dunya is dunya, greed and lust will always be there. So where a minister or a governor is not getting paid as much, that's when the khianat starts, that's when the betrayal starts, that's when the zulm and the oppression starts, that's when he will start taking bribes and rishwan. So the way to stop the bribery, to the way to stop the corruption, Umar al who made sure, remember talking about this 1400 years ago, when well, no one ever thought like that, but Umar al who had that deep understanding, he knew people that if we don't pay them properly or what they are worth, then what's going to happen is that they themselves will not do their job properly, that's one. And number two, they will then start chasing the dunya, which in a way is not their fault. You can't blame them because remember, dunya, you need to earn, you need to make a living. So if the Islamic government is not paying them a good salary, what they're naturally going to do is they're going to naturally think about, you know, deceive people, do khiyana, try to eke out money from this person or that person, trying to take bribes. So to uh, minimize any corruption, it may be necessary that the governors and the armies they take, uh, you know, salaries and they also take high salaries as well. Next point then goes on to explain that under Umar al Anhu's Khilafat, the state, i.e. the Islamic state, was divided into the following provinces. So going back to what I explained before, that you had the, the main state, and then each jazeera, or each kind of uh, country, was split up into two main provinces, and then from each province you had districts. So if we have a, a look at the paragraph in front of us, 
like he says, Arabia, or in the Arabian Peninsula, the Hejaz, now split up into two provinces, two kind of like to say capital city, two. Obviously, the main capital city was Medina, but there were two sections. So that was Mecca and Medina Munawwara. So you had in Medina Munawwara, you had Umar al Anil being the governor and the leader, and then you had someone else in charge of Mecca. You then move along to Iraq, which was divided into two places provinces Basra and Kufa. Then in the upper reaches of uh, the river Tigris and the river Euphrates, you have a place called Jazeera. Again, these are all like names of different <laughs> provinces. Syria was a province, I Syria, the Sharm area, that in itself was a province. Uh, Palestine was split up into two provinces, Ayla and Ramallah. Ramallah also exists as well nowadays. Ayla was the <coughs> historic name of Jerusalem, where Masjid al Aqsa is. Egypt divided into two provinces, Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt. And Persia was divided into three provinces, Khurasan, and there's a hadith about Khurasan, and that's where the Dajjal will emerge from, and Azerbaijan and Fars. So these are different names, but these were different provinces which were split up during Sayyidina Umar al Anbu's time. Now some of the of Umar al Anbu's uh, reforms or initiatives, he was the first to establish a department regarding complaints against the officers of the state. So the very first person to have a platform where if anybody had any complaints against any of the armies, any of the ministers, they could go to this particular court, make their complaint, and then Umar al Anhu himself or Muhammad ibn Maslama would then investigate and take action if there is a need so. Now, Muhammad bin Maslama, brothers and sisters may remember, is that Muhammad ibn Maslama who killed Qab bin Ashraf. Qab bin Ashraf was an enemy of Islam, and not only that, he was also, he used to always also mock Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ridicule Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So he was assassinated by Muhammad ibn Maslama. So Muhammad ibn Maslama, he was in charge of this particular uh, court, if that makes sense. He also goes on to explain that any complaints which were made against a particular army or governor, they were summoned to come to Medina Munawwara. They were told to go to Medina Munawwara and then in Medina Munawwara, uh, Umar al Anhu would take action against them if they were found to be guilty. So again, he was the uh, first person to establish a kind of like an office for complaints. Some of the things which Umar al Anhu began, some of the things which he pioneered, he was the first person to introduce a public ministry system where the records of officials and soldiers were kept. A daftar, that's the, that's the Arabic name, dafatir or daftar. So all the soldiers who had participated in battles or all those who had to, to do uh, like what we call a state required uh, battles or wars, their names were written down by Umar al -Dhanu. So he had a list of every single person who were soldiers, who had fought, who had intended to fight for the sake of Islam. And the importance of this particular record, brothers and sisters, is so that in future, if there is a need for jihad, if there is a need for battle, then he's got the names there, Umar al -Dhanu. So he could obviously uh, call those soldiers as and when required. But not only that, I mentioned in the earlier sessions, that these soldiers, if anything happens to them, or their family are in need, 
then Umar al Anhu would obviously use this register to give an annual instalment, an annual kind of reward or a salary for the effort the soldiers have made. So that was another reason why Umar al Anhu made sure that he had a list of all the soldiers. He was also the first to appoint police forces to keep civil order. So police force, that started from Sayyidina Umar bin Khattab al Anhu because you can't just have just all the time just uh, judges and courts. You also need someone on the street to make sure that everything is in order. Just having courts there and judges there, it doesn't necessarily mean that crime and these kind of things will stop. You need to have somebody on the streets, on the road checking that no crimes, no zulm, no oppression, no looting, no stealing, no armed robbery of these kind of sort or nature is taking place. So again, he was the first to appoint police forces and he was the first to discipline the people when they become disordered. In other words, what we call something in Arabic as ta'zir. So ta'zir are not penal punishments. I mentioned this in the last course. Uh, penal punishments for like say adultery, for stealing, for drinking alcohol, for slandering a chaste woman. What we mean here ta'zir is that if say for example somebody is uh, doing something wrong outside but it can't be punishable by the state. So it's not like he is drinking alcohol but he's doing something bad. <coughs> or it's not like he's slandering chaste women but he may be slandering say uh, a man, not about zina but about something else. So he was the first person to kind of introduce what we call ta'zim where they would be brought to Umar al Anhu's court and he would lash them, not that many times, like one or two times, punish them so that it acts as a deterrent that they don't make that same mistake again. It's like, say, for example, people who weren't praying salah, so they would be brought to Umar al Anhu's majlis and gathering, he would lash them and obviously tell them to stop praying salah. You know, those kind of actions, those who were not fasting, so they would be brought to Umar al Anhu's uh, court and they would be lashed for not fasting. So he was the very first person to start disciplining people. Leave at, leave at the next section about canals, it's not important. Uh, something else here about reforms, uh, some things which he kind of introduced during his time. So he explains there that during his Khilafah, during his reign, he extended and renovated the Haram in Mecca and Masjid al-Nabawi in Medina Munawwara. So during his time, uh, Makkah, Mukarrama, the Haram was renovated and also Masjid Nabawi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was renovated as well. Number two, during Umar al Anhu's time, he also ordered the expulsion of the Christians and the Jewish communities of Najran and Khaybar and allowing them to reside in Syria and Iraq. Now, Khaybar is a place which is approximately 200 kilometers away from Medina Munawwara. And in the books of Sirah, you must have read that the Jewish community, they were based in Medina. But because they broke the covenant which they had with Rasulullah Rasulullah expelled them from Medina and told them to go to Khaybar. So during Umar al Anhu's time, he expelled the Jews again from Khaybar and told them to go to Syria. And it's mentioned in the books of Hadith that when Umar al Anhu was expelling the Jews from Khaybar, the Jews of Khaybar were saying to Umar al Anhu that, O oh Umar, have you forgotten? what Abu Qasim sallallahu alayhi sallam said. And in other words, have you forgotten what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said? So Umar al-Anhu said to the Jews, what did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam say? So the Jews said that, oh Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said that we are going to live in Khaybar forever. That you're not going to expel us from Khaybar. 
So Umar ibn al who said to the Jews that, Oh Jews, you are lying because Rasulullah did not say that you can stay in Khaybar forever. But what Rasulullah said is that you can reside in Khaybar temporarily, but a time will come when you will also be expelled from Khaybar as well. So when the Jews heard this from Umar al Anhu, the Jews then said to Umar, Oh Umar, Prophet Wasallam was just joking. He, I was sort of joking, oh, he didn't really mean that, oh, you're going to expel us from Khaybar and take us to Syria. He was just joking. He kind of, in a way, is allowing us to stay in Khaybar. So Umar al Anhu got even more angry on the Jews and he said that, you saying now the Prophet is joking and he expelled them from Khaybar and told them to go to Syria. And the same also regarding the Christians, they were at a place called Najran. So they were told to leave Najran, which was within the Arabian Peninsula, and move to Iraq. He also, some of the reforms of Sayyidina Umar al Anhu, he issued orders that these Christians and Jews should be treated well, subhanAllah, and allotted them the equivalent land in their new settlements. So it wasn't like someone may think that, or oh, they were expelled from Khaybar, so that means they were left homeless like refugees in Iraq and in Syria. No, it was totally away from that. Basically, they were told to go to Syria, to go to Iraq. They were told by Umar al Anhu, I they meaning the dwellers of Iraq and Syria were told that when these Jews come to you and start living amongst you, then treat them well. Don't look down upon them. Don't say that they're refugees <coughs> and don't treat them harshly. Treat them well. And also, not only that, brothers and sisters, but Umar <coughs> al who also allocated for them the houses which they had in Khaybar, the exact meters or number of yards of land they had in Khaybar, uh, Sayyidina Umar bin Khattab anhu allowed the Jews and the Christians to have the exact number of yards of land in Iraq and in Syria and in Shah. Another of Umar anhu's rulings, Umar also forbade non-Muslims to reside in the Arabian Peninsula for longer than three days. I mentioned this in the last course, that this was actually uh, a desire of Sayyiduna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam actually the Akhrijul Yahuda min Jazeera til Arab. Akhrijul Yahuda wa Nasara min Jazeera til Arab. To expel all the Jews and the Christians from the Arabian Peninsula. So this came into fruition during Sayyiduna Umar al Anhu's time, that during his time, Sayyiduna Umar al Anhu expelled all the Jews and all the Christians out of the Arabian Peninsula. He didn't allow them that you can come into Arabian Peninsula for business, for tijarat, for these kind of things, for buying and selling, for shopping, these kind of things, but you can't remain in the Arabian Peninsula for more than three days. And another thing which Umar al Anhu started with his sisters is that he established something what we call the Baytul Mar, the public or the central treasury started and began by Umar al Anhu. Now let me move on to the next slide, brothers and sisters. Okay, what is the Baytul Mal? Now Baytul Mal, think of it to be a kind of a federal reserve where you have all the states, money, income, all being gathered at the central treasury, the central public treasury. Now, if we have a look at that first paragraph there, he explains that during the time of Rasulullah there was no need for a bait in one. There's two reasons why there was no need, because number one, uh, there was, because obviously the Sahabas, Prophet they all lived a life of, there wasn't like surplus wealth. And furthermore, any kind of beauty which did come to Prophet it was distributed straight away. 
So there's no need for a Baytul Mal during Prophet's time. Similarly, there was no need for a Baytul Mal during Abu Bakr Radlan's time. And he's going to explain that when Abu Bakr Dhanu passed away, there was only one dirham in the public treasury. In other words, that there wasn't a need for a building. When he passed away, he only left behind one dirham for the state. That's it. Everything which he had, everything which the state had, was straight away always distributed. It was like money would come in and expenditure would then more or less be 99.99% of the income which was coming, most of it will go over on turnover regarding salaries for the qazis, for the judges, for the imams. There was hardly anything left in the public treasury. Now, during Umar al Anhu's time, because there were a lot of what we call fighting, a lot of areas were being conquered. The non-Muslims were giving tax and jizya, again these words, jizya brothers and sisters, kharaj, we touched on in our previous course. So because there were all these poll tax, agriculture tax being given, so there was now a need to kind of store the income which the state was generating by, obviously through zakat, through sadqa from the Muslims and through uh, tax from the non-Muslims in the name of Jizya and in the name of Kharaj. So what happened was that you then have the beginning of what we call a Baytul Mal. Now he then goes on to explain that that then led to something what we call a modern day term, the welfare state, the benefits. So again, SubhanAllah, Umar al anhu he was the first one to pioneer the benefit system. So again, we read before the disability system, Umar al who started. Similarly, the welfare system, that began and that was started by Sayyidina Umar al He also, this particular part here, what he says, he also made it necessary that every minister in every region had to, to stockpile food in case of famine or in case of a drought. And we look at it later that during Umar al time there was a very big disaster, there was a big famine. So that's when he had to, to use the, uh, the stock in Medina and also in other places to support and help the Muslims. So again, every government were expecting to kind of stockpile food in every region in case of a disaster or a famine. Uh, as I said, Hazrat Umar al-Anhu was the first person to introduce social security, which is like the benefit system. Retirement pensions were provided to elderly people. So pensions, subhanAllah, that was also started by Sayyidina Umar bin Khattab anyone who was old and who was unable to work. So the pension, the system, that again was innovated by Sayyidina Umar bin Khattab Also it goes to explain, babies who were abandoned were also taken care of. It was very common in those days. Obviously, you could say to a certain extent now, but uh, now you obviously have the social service that will take over the baby. But in a way, they kind of like provide. So if, they, if the baby or the child was to go into, uh, like, uh, was to be, like, say, uh, fostered by another parent, then the parent, the other person, does get, like, benefits from the government. So very similar, that if babies were left abandoned, uh, or the parents or the mother was not fit enough to look after the baby and he had to, to be given to somebody else to be looked after so he's going to explain that every like with each baby 100 dirhams would be spent on that baby annually for its development in other words 100 dirhams would be given as benefit to that baby to the parents so that it can be looked after properly also, the things as well that food rationing 
using coupons, which we will come back later. As I said, there was a famine, so Umar ibn Anduf started what we call food rationing. And you look at it like the way during obviously World War II, uh, there was also like food rationing as well in the UK. So the government here of the West will kind of say it was their idea, food rationing and having a coupon and then you take it to the local shop and you're only allowed to take this much amount of bread or this much amount of milk. So they make it as though that is their idea. But actually this was the idea, subhanAllah, which started from Umar al He started this food rushing, not all the time, at the time of necessity and durura, like there's a famine, so that everybody gets something rather than one person eating everything and the rest don't get everything, anything. So he started what we call food rationing, using coupons, and he also started something called a poverty threshold, which made, where he made efforts to make sure that there was a minimum standard of living. So like there's no one below the line of poverty. Even now as well in the UK, you'll find people who are actually below poverty, that they actually live in poverty. Umar al who made sure that there should be no one in the Islamic State living under the line of poverty. So this is all, Umar al some other reforms we'll mention later. But all these things, in particular about the benefit system, that in itself you can do, you know, like a one-day course just about the way he worked out the benefit system. So, obviously the income which was generated through the kharaj, through the taxing of the non-Muslims, through the sadqah, through the zakat. Now, what I'm trying to explain is that if he was someone who was corrupt, someone who was money-orientated, someone who was more dunyada, what would have happened is that that leader would have been happy, oh, we've got so much money in our bank, we've got so much money in our treasury, uh, do you know what, let's not give it to anyone, let's just use it for ourselves and let's just use it for the ministers. And we see this form of corruption taking place, unfortunately, in Muslim countries where the people are dying through hunger, but you see the ministers and the leaders, they're living a lavish life. The people are dying because of hunger, they're dying, they can't eat anything, they are being treated worse than animals, but the government ministers and the leader Swanullah's living like a luxury lifestyle. So Umar al who was a total opposite. When any money came to the public treasury, when it came to the Bayt al-Mal, Umar al who thought ways of giving it out. He thought of ways of giving it out. That's why he introduced, okay, the benefit system. So people who are not working, they will get some funds. That's why he introduced disability allowance. That anyone who is disabled, they will get funds. That's why he introduced, say, pensions for the elderly. That's why he introduced, like, for the orphans and for the lapid, lapid are abandoned children, they will get allowance, an annual allowance. Those who are soldiers, they will get an uh, uh, annual allowance. So all these initiatives and ideas were formed by Umar al Anhu, and the main reason why is that he didn't want a single penny or a single dirham to remain in the public treasury. But Umar al Anhu knew that if there was money in the public treasury left over, it will tempt, it may not tempt him, but it will definitely may tempt the other ministers and the other government officials or oh, there's some money left over let's go half far let's go you know like quarter quarter on it so to stop the corruption to stop the people taking the state owned assets for their own benefit umar al who was very strict and he made sure that any way is possible to distribute the wealth is far more better now moving on to the next part Treatment of conquered people. Now, Umar al Anhu Subhanallah was the first person to allow allowances for non Muslims. Subhanallah. Even non Muslims were getting benefits as well. So, again, it wasn't just for Muslims the benefit system, the welfare system, the social security. It wasn't just for 
uh, Muslims, as again, some may think, oh, Umar Dadu being a Muslim, being a Amir Mu'minin, is going to care for the Muslims. Obviously, he will because he's the believer of the believers. Sorry, he's the Amir of the believers. But he would also care for the non Muslims as well. And there's a very beautiful story here, I'm sure you, some of you may have heard. That once Umar ibn Anhu was in the streets of Medina when he saw a man begging. So he saw a man begging. So, and I'm sure you must have heard before that Umar ibn Anhu, he never liked people begging. Muslims, he never liked it because that it's humiliation. He never liked anyone, Muslim, non Muslims, begging because. They lose that respect, they lose that kind of uh, nobleness by begging, asking people for you know, loose change, these kind of things. Also, Umar al Dangu hated it. So, when he found this person begging, he asked that, Why are you begging for? Aren't you receiving uh, anything from the Bayt al Mal? Aren't you receiving any kind of treasury, any kind of allowance from the Bayt al -Mal. So the man replied that I am a Jew, I am a Jew, and the reason why I am begging is that I cannot afford to pay the jizya. Jizya is a tax, remember jizya is the Arabic word which means tax. So the tax which was levied upon every non-Muslim, I am unable to pay for that. So because I am unable to pay for it, that's why I am begging, asking people Give me some money so that I can pay for the tax. Now I'm going to explain that Umar ibn Anhu then held his hand, took him to the Baytul Mal, and ordered that you pay jizya all your life, and then you get betrayed when you reach old age. In other words, you living, you were living in an Islamic state, and every year you used to pay your jizya. So now you pay your jizya, but now you reached old age and you are being betrayed. What I mean by that, brothers and sisters, you're being betrayed. It means that now when you've reached old age, no one's looking after you. You need to now beg to start paying your taxes. So therefore, Umar al ordered to provide that man pension. And from that day, it was so ordered for all Jews and Christians and others. So from that day onwards, any other Jew, any other Christian, any other idol worshipper, fire worshipper, whoever it may be, were told that they could now receive pensions, obviously not for every non-Muslim, but the ones who were unable to work, the ones who had disabilities, they were now, or the ones who were elderly, they were now permitted and allowed to take uh, money or funds, allowances from the Bayt al so that they can be looked after. So again, the system, when you look at it in the UK, it's not our country, it's not a Muslim country, but they provide for us. So this was something started by Umar al Anhu when he would provide for the non-Muslims, for the Jews and for the Christians uh, in Medina Munawar. Again, there's like another story here. Uh, this is of a particular uh, woman. Again, it's a, a detailed story, but again, it tells us how caring Umar al Anhu was, how much he would make sure that no one in the Islamic State was suffering. Now, it goes on to explain that, and I'm sure I explained this early on in the course, and I'm sure all the brothers and sisters are aware that Umar al Anhu would do a nightly kind of circulation of the streets of Medina. So he would go around visiting people's homes, asking people, do they need anything? Now there's a beautiful story here that once uh, there was a mother, uh, Umar al-Anhu and Abdurrahman bin Awf, uh, sorry, Umar al-Anhu and his slave Aslam, they were uh, they were on the outskirts of Medina, they were praying tahajjud when Umar al-Anhu heard a baby crying. 
So he heard a baby crying and he approached the mother and said to the mother that fear Allah and look after your child carefully. Baby was crying. So he said to the mother that look, fear Allah and look after the child properly. Now I'm just going to go over the paragraph because it takes too long, but this happened twice, three times. And the child basically, after every couple of hours, was like crying. So Umar al anhu was saying to the woman, Wow to you, you appear not to be a good mother. How is it that your child could not sleep peacefully during the night? So in other words, the baby was always constantly waking up crying. So Umar al anhu firstly went and told her nicely, look, look after the baby. But what happened was that he was still crying. So one of them who got angry with the mother and said, look, you're not a good mother. If this child is always crying, that means you're doing something wrong. Now, if we have a look at the next part of the uh, paragraph, it goes to explain that the woman didn't know that this man is actually Amir Kukmini, Umar bin Khattab al -Glandu. So, the woman basically uh, said to this man that the reason why this baby is crying is because I have weaned the child forcefully. Meaning that child, it's like obviously breastfed by its mother. In the Islamic, obviously, looking at it from a ruling Muslim point of view, in the Hanafi faith, it's around 30 months, two and a half years. And then afterwards, the child then goes on to solids. So, this child was weaned forcefully, meaning that it was only a few months old. And the mother had to, to start breastfeeding the child and had to, to start giving it solid food. And the reason why she did, uh, she did that, brothers and sisters, is because, if you look at the last line of the paragraph, because Umar al who grants allowance only for such children that have been weaned. In other words, Umar al whose rule at that time was, if a baby is off the mother's milk, is off the uh, mother's breast milk, and it's going to start eating solids, so it needs money, like what's the solids cost. So only then I will give allowances to the mothers, uh, to the mother for the child. So this woman here, obviously, she thought about it, she thought, you know what, let me quickly get my child off breast milk so that I could then get allowance from Umar al anhu and I could then use that to look after the child. But it wasn't the right decision for that woman to make because then that meant that the child would always be left hungry, malnourished, uh, not uh, nourished properly and it would lead to the child always crying and being hungry. So when Umar al anhu heard this, he goes and explains that if you look at the next part of the paragraph, it goes on to explain that Umar al anhu ordered, uh, the second to last line, that the mother should not wean their children only for the sake of allowance for the suckling. And it then goes on to explain that uh, he ordered, uh, look at the next part of the, yeah, it goes like he then ordered that basically any baby, any children, whether they are weaning or not weaning, then uh, they would be given allowances by Umar al -Lanhu. Okay, so that's the story with regards to uh, this particular mother. Again, the next story here, just a, another story of Umar al uh with his uh, slave Aslam regarding uh, what Umar al who saw uh, against some babies crying as well, some children crying. Very similar to the story, many of you have heard where some of the Sahabas pretended that they were eating. So it's a very similar story. Uh, what happened in this one here, again, Umar al anhu he was once with his uh, slave Aslam when he saw a fire from afar. So he thought, well, there's probably some uh, travelers coming to Medina. So he approached them. And he then found out, or he then saw, that there was a mother, and
and there were some children crying. So Umar al saw that there was a mother, there was a fire there, and she was warming something. So Umar al uh, opened the, the pot and found that there was nothing inside, just some water, and she was just boiling it. So Umar al asked that, now what's happening? Why are these children crying for? So the mother said that the children are crying is because they are, haven't eaten, they're hungry. And I'm just, I'm just boiling some water to give them the impression that I'm cooking something for them. And through that softness or sweetness of the water being boiled, they may go to sleep. So when Umar al-Anhu when he heard that, he was heartbroken. Because he cared, as I was saying before, for every single person in the Islamic State. He tried his best for every single person. He would like go around, you know, looking for people, their needs, see if he could rectify the situation. And when he finds this woman with young children who've got no food, nothing to eat, Umar al Anhu, he then returns back to Medina. He goes to the Bayt al Mal, he carries with him like sack of food, butter, these things. He puts it on his back and he's now taking it towards the outskirts of Medina to this woman. So his slave Aslam is saying to Umar al Anhu that, O Amir al Mu'minin, O Master, allow me, now let me take this sack of food, let me take the sack of grains and the butter and the ghee to this woman. By, by the way, I am your khadim, I am your slave. So Umar al Anhu said that, no, you will not carry my burdens of sins in the hereafter. Because Umar al Anhu felt so bad and upset that there was a woman there, vulnerable, who hadn't eaten and he felt responsible for that. So what he said is that, you know what, you're not going to be responsible for my sins in the hereafter. You're not going to be carrying my burden. So he then decided to take the, the sack of food himself to this particular woman. He gave it to the woman. The woman ate. And then he goes on to explain that the, uh, the last paragraph. Uh, in fact, you deserve to take the place of the Khalifa instead of woman. Because like the other woman before, this woman didn't know that this was Umar al -Ladi. So Umar consoled her. If you look at the last part of the story, he goes to explain that after Umar al Anhu gave the food to that woman, he didn't go back to Medina straight away. He sat for a while at a place close by and kept on watching the children and then he went to Medina with Umar. So he, his slave Aslam asked him that why did you do that for? Umar al Anhu said that the same way when I approached this woman, I saw the children crying. I wanted to now stay back and see these children happy and smiling. So because of that reason, he went back. You know that feed, you know that image he had of these children crying and so on? He wanted to now see another image of these children. And that is that they are happy, they are joyous, they are smiling. That's why he stayed back for some time until he saw the laughter and the smile on their face. Only then he decided to leave. Now the next two paragraphs very quickly are the next two incidents during Umar al Anhu's time. Talks about the famine which took place during Umar al Anhu's time and also the play. Now, remember, brothers and sisters, that just because a Khilafat system is working, just because the Islamic government is uh, fruitful and is doing well, it doesn't mean that it is immune from natural disasters. Now, obviously, I don't want to go into detail here that why we have natural disasters, but one thing to point out here is that this world is what we call Darul Sabab, it's the world of causes. 
So just because someone is successful, even though he may be a pious Muslim, it doesn't mean that he's immune from, say, cancer. It doesn't mean that he's immune, say, for example, from any illnesses or sicknesses. It doesn't mean that he's immune from difficulties in life. Because it's actually the contrary. And I mentioned said this before. Ashaddu nasi bala an al al amthal al amthal which means that the most tested out of all the people are the prophets and then the ones thereafter, thereafter. So obviously, some, no one should be thinking that Umar al is such a great person, his government was so amazing and so majestic that why on earth was there a famine during his time? Why on earth was there a plague during his time? So this is like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is like the dunya, the world we live in, that famines, natural disasters, these things, no one is immune from it. Just because you're pious, it doesn't mean that you're not going to fall ill. Just because you're pious, it doesn't mean that you're immune from the disasters and the difficulties and the trials and the tribulations of this world. Now, during Umar Radlanhu's Khilafat reign, there were two major difficulties. One was the famine, uh, which basically led to many, many people dying. Now, this famine was in Medina Munawwara, and it goes on to explain that the entire Arabian Peninsula were affected by this particular famine. So again, Umar al Anhu, he wrote to all the provincial leaders of Syria, Palestine, Iraq for aid, and he goes to explain that the first governor to respond was Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah radiallahu ta'ala So remember, it, it, the famine hit the Arabian Peninsula, but other parts of the Islamic State, like Iraq, Syria, Palestine, they weren't affected. So Umar al Anhu sent out a plea to them that please need to help us. So Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah al Anhu, he sent uh, a caravan where it says whose one end will be here at Syria and the other one will be in Medina. Indicating that there will be trucks full of, well not trucks, but caravans full of supplies and goods where it will begin in Syria and the end will be in Medina. In other words, indicate I'm going to give you more or less everything of Syria, all our reserves, all the stockpile of food in Syria is going to go straight to Medina Munawwara to assist the poor and to assist the ones who are in need. And from this one, like, we can understand another point here, brothers and sisters, and that is that whenever a Muslim country is going through difficulties, it could be wars, it could be famine, it could be a disaster, it could be an earthquake, the other Muslim countries should all help and assist in the time of need. And this is what happened here. The Arabia was in a state of emergency because there was a big famine, a drought, people were dying, animals were dying, everything was dying. So it was the other surrounding Muslim countries like Syria, Palestine, uh, Iraq, and so on. They all helped and they sent their reserves of food, stockpiles, which they had in their country in case of an emergency, in case of a famine or a drought. They were all sent to Medina Munawwara to Umar bin Khattab al -Bilan. And it just goes on to explain that uh, for internally displaced people, i.e. those who, were, who had to leave their homes, their houses, because of the famine, Umar al who hosted a dinner every night in Medina where there was more than 100,000 people attending. So he would provide food, not just like give them like, you know, uh, some food in their hands, whatever. Actually, Umar al who would even make provisions that they even cook the food and it was then provided to them. The next major event during Hazrat Umar al Anhu's time was the plague. So there was a plague during Umar al Anhu's time. Uh, 
This actually affected not Arabia because Arabia was hit by the famine. But in Syria and Palestine, there was a plague there, a disease, which kind of killed many, many people. So again, one of these Sahaba, subhanAllah, Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah who helped Umar al-Anhu with the stockpile of food, he lost his life during this particular plague. And it's mentioned that approximately 25,000 Muslims died in this plague, Tawood al Kubra, this big, big plague during Umar al-Anhu's time. So these were the two kind of like natural disasters natural what we call state of emergencies during Umar al Anhu's time. Obviously we don't have time to go into in detail but you could imagine like we've read this far from today morning until we now how caring Umar al Anhu was. So you can imagine how much this must have hurt Umar al Anhu, how caring he must have been, how he looked after people who were desperately in need during the plague and during the famine. So he sacrificed everything. He sacrificed his own uh, allowance, his own kind of, the allowance he was, he had a right off from the state because he was an Amir, he was allowed to take uh, 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 wages and food from the Beitul Mal because he was the leader of the believers. He gave that up, he said, I'm gonna give that my right to those who are more in need. He said to himself that, how can the Amir al be enjoying food in Medina when people are dying in the other parts of Arabia, when people are dying because of the plague in Syria and Palestine? So this was Umar al anhu he starved himself, but that is more, that is nothing to Umar al anhu he rather see himself starve rather than see any of his people and any of his flock starving. And this was Umar al anhu during the plague and during the famine. Again, some reforms of uh, Umar al anhu some of them we've already mentioned. The Baytul Mal, the judicial courts he established, uh, army headquarters, construction of roads and canals, subhanAllah. Roads, Umar al anhu started. Okay, before there weren't any proper roads, but the system of roadworks, the way it kind of you know connects with everything, Umar al anhu started. Schools were established. That would have been a very good topic to look at in detail. But what I will mention is that Umar al anhu he established a school in every main province. So there was one in Makkah, there was one in Medina, there was one in Basra and Kufa. And those of the brothers who study Arabic in particular would know Kufa and Basra, they're very well known for the Nahwan Sub, their syntax and their grammar. So Umar al anhu started the first pioneer, the first school there, the first madrasa there, Egypt, Palestine. And one thing, you know, I didn't mention this before as well in the last school that if you want to grow, if you want a community to grow, you require knowledge. Yeah, you can't have, if you want to build for a generation, you need to build the foundation must be on knowledge. Right? If you want to build for one or two days, yeah, then fine, give them some money, give them some food. But if you want to build for a generation, a Sadqai Jariya, then the way you do it is by building Madaris, by building schools. So Umar al anhu he pioneered that. All the main capitals, all the main provinces, uh, schools were started by Umar al anhu Salaries for Imams, Muazzins, Ustads, teachers, they were given by Umar al anhu he's initiated all that. Masjids were improved, as I already explained before. Police stations and prisons were built. Uh, the first Islamic lunar calendar, as I already explained, proper weights and measures were introduced. Weights in terms of uh, when it comes to buying and selling the mozul and uh, mikial items, they were introduced by Umar al -Anhu. Population census was established, a database of every individual, orphanages and welfare homes, they all began with Umar al -Anhu. Many of these things which we have mentioned, alhamdulillah, over the past, uh, six, seven hours. Do you have a question? Yeah, just interesting. 
he would, what was the curriculum of the school? Yeah, I don't have to do. They'll be basic in that. I mean, step C, these things. It would be interesting to look at that as well. Yeah. I don't think so. They, they had websites in those days where you could download you something. <laughs> Jim, give us that. Uh, confusion one really. Um, with, with, with everything that we're moving up to uh, all along the gun and a lot of things that have come about from that, I've got two two things. One, throughout the sea law of all of the one Well by the way, I haven't finished with this one. Okay. I haven't finished. Okay. Wait, just, well, just, okay, just quickly then, please. Uh, we've still got the assassination of Azul Murugan yet. Okay. Uh, it's, it's okay, you can ask Okay, what I was going to say is the role of uh, Usman Radiolan and Ali Radiolan within, whilst the Umar Radiolan uh, Khilafat was running, how were they deciding the way Umar Radiolan was We hear a lot about Umar Radiolan next to Abu Bakr throughout the sea life. But we don't hear much about. No, they did have a role. Hazrat Ali Radiolan was a judge during Umar Radiolan's time. He was a judge in Umar Radiolan's time, and as far as that, Usman was also part of the Shura. So. They did have an important part to play there. Okay, now, uh, inshallah, the next point which we're going to mention, the next section of Umar al Anhu's life is regarding his assassination. Now, Umar al Anhu, he had this policy. And I mentioned one of his policies in the slide that he did not allow or permit non Muslims, Christians, and Jews in particular to live in the Arabian Peninsula. He never allowed that, he never liked it. And the reason why, brothers and sisters, he never liked it is because. Christians, Jews, they are what we call defeated people. Obviously, they've been thrown out of Khaybar, they've been thrown out of Najran. And you can never ever trust their motives. You can never ever trust that what they're gonna do next. And that is so beautifully mentioned in the Quran. Walan Taraba Ankal Yahudu Walan Nasara Hatta Tatta Biamilata. That the Jews and the Christians will never be pleased with you unless you follow their religion. So unless you follow them completely, they are the Jews and the Christians, you can never ever trust them. So Umar al who always kept this in mind and he never really agreed or never really wanted the Jews, the Christians, uh, people from other faiths being in and around the Haramein being in and around the Arabian Peninsula. But in spite of saying that, some companions, some Sahabas, they did have some non-Muslim slaves. Even though Umar al-Land who disliked it, wasn't really, how to say, an advocate of it, but he allowed certain Sahabas to have non-Muslim slaves, non-Muslims khuddam with them. And one particular Sahaba who had a non-Muslim slave was Hazrat Mughira bin Shu'ba radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Hazrat Mughira bin Shu'ba radiallahu anhu. Now he had a slave whose name was Fayroz and his kunyat or his title was Abu Lu'lu. So Fayroz was his name, Abu Lu'lu was his title and his kunya. Now Abu Lu'lu, he was a, a blacksmith and his master, i.e. Mughira bin Shu'ba, would take a lot of his earnings. So he was a slave and obviously being a master you had a right over your slaves' incomes and earnings. So his master, Ayyubhira bin Shurba, would take a lot of his earnings, which obviously 
as you can imagine, upsetting Abu Lublu. So Abu Lublu went to Umar ibn Anhu and asked Umar ibn Anhu for justice. In other words, can you speak to my master and tell him to cut or to reduce what I have to pay to my master Ubida bin Shoba. Now Umar ibn Anhu told this told Abu Lublu to be patient. I told Abu Lublu that don't worry, he's not actually charging you too much, he's not taxing you too much, but just be patient. Now he's mentioned in the books of Sirah that the amount which Mubira bin Shurba was charging Abu Lublu wasn't that much, it was actually peanuts. But because he made that complaint, and Umar al Anhu being someone just and he doesn't really want anyone to make complaints, he said to Abu Lublu that, okay, just be patient, go back to what you're doing. And in the meantime, Umar al Anhu went and spoke to Mughira bin Shurba and told Mughira bin Shurba that, you know what, you should reduce the uh, the tax which you have levied on your slave Abu Lulu. Now Abu Lulu, because he got the message from Umar al Anhu to be patient, he got angry even more. He was thinking, oh, look, Umar al Anhu is not helping me. But actually, Umar al Anhu wanted to give this universal kind of picture to Abu Lulu that, no, you be quiet, you go and do your work, and then in private, Umar al Anhu was having a word with Bukhira bin Shubha. It's like, say, sometimes it happens where there may be a senior imam in the masjid and then you have a junior imam in the masjid. So somebody may make a complaint to the senior imam about the junior imam that, oh, this problem, that problem. So now you don't want to, like, cause rifts between the imams. So you're the senior imam, so you may say to that person that, oh, don't worry, you know, you know forget your complaint. I'm not going to pay attention. So you give that united front to the people but then behind you speak to the junior imams and you know about this complaint and shikayat and so on don't do that again so this is what Umar al Anhu was trying to do because obviously he didn't want to give impression to Abu Lulu that Umar and Bukhira bin Shubba they are at loggerheads because Umar al Anhu was always an advocate of ittihad in particular when he came in front of non-Muslims to show that the Muslims are together and are united so Umar al Anhu said to Abu Lulu that you be quiet, you go back, do what you're doing. And then behind, he was speaking to Mughira bin Shubba, telling Mughira bin Shubba to reduce the, uh, the tax which he had levied on Abu Lulu. As you can see from the, the next paragraph, that Abu Lulu was still angry, he crafted a knife which had two curving blades made out of stone and he also bought some poison as well. So he kind of like stuck uh, the, the blade, he dipped it into the poison and the person who he bought the poison from, he said to that person that if I was to stab or kill anyone or hit anyone or strike anyone with this sword, and the poison was to inject in that person, would that person survive? The person who sold the poison said no. So indicating his idea, sometimes it happened that he could survive because of, sometimes you can't survive through a stab wound. But he wanted to finish up Umar al -Anhu. So the way he could do that is by dipping the blade into poison and then making sure that when he does stab Umar al -Anhu, the the thing which we kill him will not only be the wound, but also the poison will then go into Umar al Anhu's body and that will then cause Umar al Anhu to die. Now, obviously, Abu Lublu, he obviously knew that Umar al Anhu would go to Masjid Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to lead the prayers. So it was Fajr time when the night before Abu Lublu he managed to sneak into the Masjid. And then when Umar al Anhu, subhanAllah, when he started this salah and he said, Allah Akbar, and Umar al Anhu was in the first rakat, 
when Abu Lulu, who was hiding behind the mimbar, suddenly comes out and he stabs Umar al Anhu in the belly and around the navel region six times. He stabs him six times. That's one. This is what we call brothers and sisters taqwa to another level. Umar al Anhu was stabbed in namaz. He doesn't make a big scene. He doesn't say, oh, everyone, I'm stabbed. He actually goes back. Like he goes back and he then ushers Abdurrahman bin Awfrad Anhu to go forward and to complete the prayer. SubhanAllah. This is Umar al-Anhu is stabbed in namaz. So he doesn't finish the namaz then and day. Since I was no, namaz end for today, you know, everybody deal with me. He didn't want to make it a big issue. So he just like moves one or two steps back. He ushers Abdurrahman bin Awfr al Anhu. He ushers him forward and he tells Abdurrahman bin Awfr al Anhu to complete the prayer. So Abdurrahman bin Awfr al Anhu completes the prayer. Afterwards, they see to Umar that he's been stabbed. Abu Lu'lu, on the other hand, because obviously you can imagine that he stabbed Umar al Anhu and he's then obviously cutting through the subs to make an exit out of the masjid. So if you imagine that Umar al who was praying the masjid, he was hiding behind his member, and then he came, he stabbed Umar, and then he needs to make a quick exit and a quick get out. So whilst leaving the masjid, Abu Lulu also struck some other sahabas as well. So he also like, he basically started like also attacking other sahabas, started stabbing them, and he totally approximately killed six or seven further sahabas on the way out. So when he was, obviously when he was going out, one of the sahabas managed to throw a cloak over him and managed to basically grip him. And Abu Lulu knew that, obviously his end is not. So what happened was that with that same blade, which he used to stab Umar al Anhu and six and seven other sahabas, he used that blade against him and he killed himself. So Umar al Anhu, after he was stabbed, <coughs> he's then taken to his house. He then asks, basically, you know, who stabbed me and so on. So somebody said that, oh, he was the slave of Mughira. So Umar al Anhu then thanks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and says, oh, by the grace of Allah, as long as a, I, I thank Allah that a Muslim did not stab me. Because if a Muslim had stabbed me, that would have meant that I didn't do my job properly. That meant that the past 12, 13 years, I was a Khalifa, I didn't do it properly. So he said, I thank Allah, it's not a Muslim. And obviously a non-Muslim stabbing me, that's obviously a death of a martyr, which Hazrat Umar al who always wanted. So he was thanking Allah that, that a Muslim hasn't stabbed me, but a non-Muslim has, and there's nothing, that's actually an honorable death that a non-Muslim, who you all can't have any guarantees for regarding their intention, regarding what's in their heart, he killed me, then that's okay, that means I died as a martyr. Now obviously we look at in the next course of Uthman al Anhu that Umar al Anhu then chose six Sahabas, it's also in the course handbook as well, and they were then going to be the selective or the committee, the Shura committee who will choose the next Khalifa of the Muslims and of the believers. Now Umar al Anhu, obviously he was severely wounded, but he asked his son to uh, ask, uh, yeah, he sent a messenger uh, to Aisha al Anha and basically asked to ask Aisha that can I be buried near Rasulullah and near Abu Bakr al Anhu in that same hujra, in that same apartment where Rasulullah and Abu Bakr al Anhu are resting. So Sayyidah Aisha al Anha initially said that, or initially wanted that place for herself. But when Umar al Anhu was asking her, she agreed and she said that, okay, I allow Umar al Anhu to be buried in my house alongside my father 
and my husband Rasulullah it's mentioned in the hadith of Bukhari that even though Sayyidina Aisha al -Hal gave the permission, Umar ibn Anubu then said to his sons that it could be so that Aisha is giving me permission because she's seeing me in this state of wafat, in this state of death, that I'm going to pass away soon, so she's probably feeling a bit sad or a bit upset. So Umar ibn Anubu said to his sons that when I do pass away, carry my coffin to Aisha of Al-Adha's house and ask her one more time that can Umar al anhu be buried in that place alongside Abu Bakr, alongside Rasulullah and if she gives permission then so be it, let me, bury, let me be buried near Abu Bakr and near Rasulullah and if she doesn't give me permission then bury me in Baqi bury me in this graveyard of Medina Munawwara. So when Umar al anhu did pass away, obviously when he did pass away, his uh, janazah was prayed by his famous companion, Hazrat Suhaib al anhu After his janazah had finished, the Sahabas carried Umar al anhus body to Aisha al anhas house. And they asked Aisha al anha one final time, are you sure? As I was saying before that, it could be so that when Umar al anhu was initially wounded and stabbed, Hazrat Aisha probably felt sorry for him and said, okay, let him. But now he's passed away, so it could be like she may change her tune and she may change her intention and her earlier decision. So the sons asked Aisha al are you sure uh, that you allowed Umar al to be buried here when she gave permission that Umar al was then buried alongside Abu Bakr al and alongside Rasulullah So that was the, obviously the sad ending of Sayyidina Umar bin Khattab al -Anhu. Obviously, we don't have uh, that much time to go over, obviously, the final statement, if that makes sense, he made. But I'll just finish off with some of the wise words Umar al anhu said. Uh, and, you know, these will be some of the things we should remember from the course. Uh, number one is, these are some of his wise words. Number one, the one who steps back will not progress. Meaning that... If you are reluctant, and this is like actually, I'll give you advice to everyone, brothers and sisters. Sometimes we Muslims, or sometimes us in general, we all are always very reluctant to do something. It could be something like, say, you know, holding a course in the masjid. You know, initially we're always reluctant. But sometimes what you need to do, you need to be a bit proactive. And just sometimes if you make the intention that you want to hold a course in the masjid, but you know, read Salatul Hajjah, say Bismillah, and then stop. And when you look at Umar al anhu all the things which he started, that's how he was. He never thought about, oh, what people are going to say. Now we just think about what people are going to say, we never get anything done. But what Umar al anhu would do is that if he had an idea, if he thought that this was a good idea, he would pray two rakat Salatul Hajjah, say Bismillah, and bus, he would then start the job. So never hold back. If you hold back, you never progress in life, that's in anything. Organization-wise, as an individual, if you always hold back and be reluctant and be shy, you're never going to go anywhere. So this is one of the teachings of Umar al Number two, it is unbecoming of that person who sits with his hands folded and prays to Allah for sustenance. Allah does not rain down gold and silver from the heavens. In other words, Umar al did not like people begging, as I explained before. He didn't like people begging. He didn't like people just receiving benefits. So he wanted people to earn a livelihood. So he didn't like people to sit in the ministry and say, oh Allah, pray, give me some money and so on. What he wanted was that he wanted people to work. Again, attain knowledge before old age settles in. Whosoever hides his secret keeps his safety safeguarded with himself. So he's telling us that if you've done something haram, something wrong, no one's perfect, I'm sure everyone's there must have been something wrong in their life. So he goes to explain that, just keep that with you, you don't have to tell anyone. The person who calls himself learner, indeed he is ignorant. And the one who calls himself from the dwellers of paradise, surely he is from the dwellers of hell. What does that mean? Don't go around and start saying that you know everything, that you're learned, you're Allah, you're Allah. 
a sign of a jahil, an ignorant person, is the one who says, I know everything. But to that you, no one knows everything. Even Musa al Islam, he once said in one of the speeches, like somebody asked him, Oh Musa, who is the most knowledgeable in this world? So Musa said, Anna. So Allah didn't like that. So what happened? Allah subhanahu wa told Musa al Islam to go and meet Khazir al Islam, and then there was the, uh, the story between Khazir al Islam and Musa al Islam. So never go around and say you know everything. Also, never go around and start giving guarantees to yourself that you're going to Jannah. Because only Allah knows best what will be our uh, final abode. Uh, again, another point here: the strength in action is never to put off what you can do today for tomorrow. If you make an intention for something in life, whether you want to change, don't say I'm going to change tomorrow. You're doing a sin. Don't say, okay, I'll, I'll change tomorrow after Fajr. No, make the intention to leave out this sin and make the intention to change from now. So when Allah gives you tawfi, you know, make the intention to change. And some of the things that prayer is connected to the heart, not by mere apparent actions, like salah, these things, ibadahs, they've got to do with the heart in terms of concentration, push you off the heart. And he also said that do not trust the character of the one who cannot control his temper. So anyone who gets angry a lot, then do not like, you can't trust such a person. So there's many wise words Umar al Anu mentioned. I'll just mention these few here so that we can, you know, take some lessons and we can slowly put these things into our life. I will conclude the course now. May Allah give us tawfiq to act tomorrow as we said. Obviously take this opportunity to thank the brothers and sisters who helped organizing this course. May Allah give all of them long life, give them hidayat. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept their efforts in hosting the course. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may you forgive their shortcomings in their course, in their organization as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq to act tomorrow as we said. وما علينا إلا البلاغ وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين